we are in the midst of one of the most fascinating chapters of Sri Aurobindo's synthesis of yoga called The Planes of Our Existence where Sri Aurobindo describes in essential terms the nature of the various planes of consciousness beginning with first principles of what makes for a plane of consciousness in the cosmos describing it as a special relationship held by the poise of Purusha consciousness and Prakriti and the relationship of these two in their aspects expressing substance of existence, consciousness and delight. It is in the variations of these three and the relationship set between Purusha and Prakriti that we find the distinction of various planes. He describes in great detail the nature of the physical plane and particularly its extreme uh, blockage holding back of consciousness and delight of consciousness in an existence which seems to be unconscious or even inconscient and in the next level of the life energy he describes the character of the life world the world of prana and there how the aspect of energy is predominating energy of consciousness not yet the full awakening into consciousness then in an entire paragraph he summarizes the key aspects of the relationship between the world of life energy and the world of matter how from the life world there are all these influences pouring into the material and from the material returning into the life world their relationship in which the material world is as if a special projection even a throwing out of life energy to experience its own separation and opposition and limitation and the relationship between these two he also points out is not rigid separation but as with everything else in nature there is a continuum and there is even a mixture of life energy leaning all the way down to the most material and rising upward to still higher ranges even as in the material domain there is a rising of gradations of matter to finer and finer realms as if trying to reach out and touch the life world or the mind world and beyond the paragraph we are at is where he takes up the big question of why we are not conscious of this enormous influence of the life world that is pouring not only in the whole of the physical world and its working but pouring into us also from people around and in the mind of, from the mind of humanity but also pouring in us from our own inner ranges and the answer to this he says is because we use normally only our corporeal senses and live wholly in the body and the physical vitality and the physical mind. In fact, all these other influences pour into us not from the physical senses or the physical body but by the vital and mental bodies and their corresponding senses. And it is this which we are now dwelling upon. He says, the vital body and the mental body possess powers, senses, capacities which are always secretly acting in us, are connected with and impinge upon our physical organs and the plexuses of our physical life and mentality. We dwelt upon this one sentence in great detail last time. We saw the distinction between the powers that correspond to the vital and mental which do not belong to the physical also the senses and their operation in the vital or the mental bodies 
and the capacities which are so much greater, so much freer in these bodies. But all these of which we are not conscious are always secretly acting in us and because they are secret we are not conscious but because they are acting they have an effect. So we are not conscious why but there is this effect that takes place. And some of these effects are so subtle that we may not notice them. Occasionally they become unusually intense and then we do notice them and very rarely those effects can be radical and then we will call it a miracle. But otherwise it is exactly the same thing which is happening normally in us even in our day-to-day -day working but of which we are almost entirely unaware. We saw some examples last time of how we sense a person's mood even before we may become conscious of their presence in the room or physically interact with them through speech or sight. But we sense because already on that level there has been a connection. One of the recent great psychics, one of the most famous is somebody I've often referred to by the name of Ingo Swan. He was an artist and he used to paint some unusual landscapes, scenes and at a particular time in his life he had the dramatic opening of his subtle sight to a degree that is rarely seen even in people who consciously try to develop the inner sight. He was able to see and sense literally in the fine details of the description the powers which are described in the yoga tradition including the power of being able to enlarge fine details not only of physical material but of the subtle bodies and the energies and as a result he has described some of these things which he saw but more interestingly painted them being an artist. He was disappointed though that although these paintings would have such great value normally if people understood what they represented most people were not interested in these paintings and they were more interested in his fantasy paintings. And uh, I recall reading in one of his books how he described seeing in people when the life force in a person was beginning to grow and increase he would see it take on specific forms in the aura in the subtle body and he would see for example above the head as if uh, large like plumes, literally plumes growing in height around the shoulders, around the arms and at some point it grew to a large enough size and intense enough that he could see this is something unusual. In most cases though when the vitality of people grew too much they would engage spontaneously in activities where they would spend or exhaust the vitality and thereby lose it completely. And he found he could often gauge when that would happen in people. But the descriptions I found unusual because in this he we find certain forms of dress that people wear. For example, you will see in military gear, in the headgear, plumes which are placed on top, particularly in the Roman style of military gear, you will see this. And many of these forms which are unusual are actually our spontaneous attempts to replicate on a f in physical level that which we sense in our inner sight. Now none of us may have seen those things with our subtle sight and yet if we were to try to aggrandize, make more dramatic or more vivid or intense a person's form, we would spontaneously dress them up in ways which physically represent what is seen in the aura. You will see this in fashion particularly where you will sometimes find people wearing clothes which are flowing and the hair particularly is given almost a cloud-like flow 
which is what you see in the subtle body normally, that kind of flowing form, fluid form, or colors and patterns which correspond to certain states of consciousness reflected in the aura, which are then represented in the form of the dress or the patterns on the dress. <coughs> I'm pointing to these examples only to highlight the fact that although we do not consciously see, the registration of what is sensed on those levels is in us and our spontaneous effort to act tends to flow along those registrations. <coughs> so Sri Aurobindo says, these possess powers, cap senses, capacities which are always secretly acting in us, are connected with and impinge upon our physical organs, and this is again something which we had described a bit last time, but now we dwell on the particular aspect of the connection with the plexuses of our physical life and mentality. Remember in the vocabulary Sri Aurobindo has used, he speaks of the subtle body as being primarily the mental body, where the true mind, uh, the true mental being lives, as distinct from the physical mentality, which is our normal thinking mind, which is largely living in the physical body, dependent on the biology and the vitality of the physical body, and not free to act in its own terms as a free mind, which is what you would experience in the free mental body. Of this, Sri Aurobindo will describe more in the next paragraph. But this is first, subtle body in which the true mental being lives, and then the vital body, which is more closely associated, he says, with the food sheath, and the two together forming the gross body of our complex existence. And this is interesting because this vital body is effectively the link. Not only it animates the gross physical body, but it also links with the mental body. And therefore the linking forms certain patterns or focal points of energy which can be seen or felt in the gross physical body and yet actually belong to the vital body which is closely associated with the gross physical and connect to the mental body. So these link points are extremely important and this is what he is referring to here when he speaks of the plexuses of our physical life and mentality. So the suggestion is of course that it's spanning the physical life and the mentality. Physical life of course is vital and physical together. So let's just dwell upon this a little bit. Sri Aurobindo does not develop this much more because these are things which are existing knowledge available in specialized traditions and there is no point in his elaborating them here. In particular, we are of course more familiar today of the Chinese medicine and its utilization of acupuncture points in the meridians which are described and the charts which you see. The less familiar though is exactly the same knowledge in the Ayurveda tradition. And in the Ayurveda tradition, the meridians uh, have a particular name and the focal points in which the meridians act are called marmas or focal points, special link points. The meridians are, uh, the equivalent of them is called nadi. And the nadi is not physical veins. It is not physical nervous system. It is in fact subtle energy flows which are in the vital body and then imprinted into the physical body but also into the mental body. And the result is the nadis actually govern and control biological processes at a more essential level than the physical nervous system itself. And so I want to dwell upon the difference between these and because of the immense value that it has, not only for us to understand the link with the mental body, but also what is possible. And that's in the next sentence where he says, by self-development we can become aware of them, possess our life in them, get through them into conscious relation with the life world and other worlds, 
and use them also for a more subtle experience and more intimate knowledge of the truths, facts and happenings of even the material world itself. Now the full understanding of this sentence will be possible only if we dwell upon what we are currently studying just a little more. So in the Ayurveda tradition, this description is quite fascinating. We recognize that in the physical body itself, the gross physical body, and the gross physical body we will identify by removing the vital body. If you remove the vital body, what happens? We say the physical body goes dead, technically, meaning it has no more life functions. Reinfuse the vital body and it comes back to life. It's as simple as that. But the vital body never separates in one go instantaneously, it withdraws gradually. And as it withdraws gradually, the f biological functions begin to slow down, become less efficient until they shut down completely. But they don't shut down all at once, they shut down in layers. The parts which have withdrawn shut down first, the parts which are still stuck shut down last. And so even today in the existing physiological study, biological study, they speak of how even when a person is technically dead, there are many cells which are still functioning and even cells within the brain which continue to function for many more hours even after the body as a whole is considered technically dead. And this is possible because many other connections exist than just the vital body in one fell swoop linking, finer gradations of the vital connect. And so this is what Sri Aurobindo is describing here when he speaks of the connection to the physical organs and the plexuses of our physical life and mentality. In Ayurveda, they speak of the nadis as the life energy flows and there are critical points where the nadis or the life energy flows cross each other. Where they cross is a special control center where more than two cross, if there are three which cross, is a more important uh, control center. Where four or more crossed, that becomes a critical control center. And these are what we call plexuses. They are focal points where many connections cross, or rather from those centers, many con connections of energy flow out. These are typically described as six in the body. Technically though, they are not in the gross physical body, they are more in the vital body. But from the vital body connecting into the gross physical, obviously they will have corresponding physical machinery or apparatus into which to plug in. And interestingly, we discover that when we study the nervous system, corresponding to the six chakras, which are in the subtle or vital body, we have large clusters of networks of the nervous system. Large clusters as if from that center you have radiating lines of the nervous system spreading out over the whole body. And this itself shows you that the biology is an expression of the life energy body. If you could sense energy flows or see them in the life energy body, you would see the physical structure of the f gross physical body is almost like a replica, a condensation, a narrow rigidification in material substance. And the nervous system of the physical body is like a secondary distribution system compared to the nadis which are a more primary distribution system for life energy. Now why is this so important? because almost all the physical biological functions can be modified by playing with the nadis because they are all dependent on the nadis and the energy flows in the nadis. This is the basis of acupuncture, acupressure or in the Ayurveda tradition it is called marma vidya. Marmas represent these special focal point points or crossing points of energy and interestingly there are 108 in the human body, reflecting a larger cosmic uh, sense of the number and the proportion and its meaning 
in the cosmos. We are like a microcosm, so the cosmos is as if reflected in us. These have very specific focal points and results. You could take some of the major nerve, uh, major marmas, and if you put a certain energy burst in them, there would be a large ripple effect in the whole functioning, first of the energy body and then on the physical body. You could take the minor marmas and modify or control specific sub-functions, first of the energy body and then the gross physical body. In Chinese medicine, this knowledge has been retained and especially utilized using needles which are punctured. And we touched upon this last time, the needles in themselves are not so important. They are more a link point for your energy and your consciousness to penetrate at a deeper level where the actual flow of the nadis exists. The nadis don't flow on the skin surface, they are inside. You could of course push an energy deep inside, but the needle becomes a link point that allows you to touch the energy flow there and through the needle you put your intention. So a critical element in this knowledge, whether of acupuncture or acupressure or marma vidya, is the content of mind which guides energy. Now this becomes important because, you see Sri Aurobindo uses this phrase when speaking of the plexuses of our physical life and mentality. So the plexus is not only turned to the physical life, but it also links to the mental body. And so it's a link point for the consciousness which is free in the subtle body, in the mind body proper, which flows through life energy into physical. So these plexuses, particularly the larger ones and the more prominent ones, are entry points for consciousness to enter in and to guide life energy flows and thence to act on the physical energy and physical functions. So what happens in us, in the mental body for example, if there's a certain shift of thought or a shift of mood in the mental body, it goes through these special centers of the plexus to create a shift in life energy and through it to create a shift in biological function. Let's say now you get happy news, suddenly you're full of joy, energy lifts, a moment ago you were down, depleted, pessimistic, now your energy lifts, you begin to see things optimistically and instantly in the physical body you measure this as a rise in serotonin levels perhaps or some other uh, hormones which rise and are associated with sensations of pleasure or happiness. Equally, if you inject somebody with those hormones, you will find the mood shifts because the link is two-way. The shift here pushes back on life energy flows which has an influence on mind. But between these, the influence of mind towards body is stronger than body towards mind. In the sense that, if you choose to shift your mood, the biology will follow, irrespective. But if you change biology, the mind will get a push, but it could still oppose and say, yes, but, I feel happier, yes, but, and it will want to as if push back on the change. And so we have a kind of a two-way influence, and this is the reason why many patients although given medicine at a biological level to change their moods and states, will push back against the medicine not realizing and the medicine has an immediate effect the first one week or a few days and then suddenly its effect drops because of the pushback from the psychology. On the other hand, if you begin the shift in the psychology first, it does not matter what's in the biology, eventually it will act there. The difference though is this, in the mental body, you are able to more freely shift states. In the biology, because it is a more dense, rigid, habitual substance, it tends to slide into habits. 
if I have a habit of being more depressed, you can lift to a happier state, but the habit will tend to pull me back. And the most obvious form in which you see this is what happens when you wake up from sleep. That's the time when you're emerging most clearly out of a subconscious condition. Whatever the changes made in the previous day, you've shifted your mood, you've had a wonderful time, your consciousness is exalted, you go to sleep, slide into a subconscious condition, and as you emerge, you emerge with the old habit imprint. And suddenly I find myself low, unhappy, or whatever the tendency of your consciousness is. If you've built up an optimistic habit, will you wake up with a happy outlook, I'm going to do stuff today, and with the push of the vital, if that's the habit you've cultivated. So, in the balance between these two extremes, from the mind you have a greater influence, more free, but less lasting. Whereas in the biology, your influence is facing more resistance, but when that influence is persisted upon, it tends to stabilize and become the new habit, it lasts longer. And in the life energy body, pranamaya kosha, a kind of an in-between. It is semi-conscious, not fully conscious, largely instinct-driven. Keep in mind also, on each of these levels, you have influences coming from the universe. Not only from the world of the mind influencing the mental body, world of the vital influencing the vital body and through it the physical, and of course in the physical body, the physical world impacting, particularly through physical substance, but also other people's thoughts entering your mental, other people's emotions entering your vital, and then your own deeper ranges, subliminal, from where influences come. And that makes for a complex mix across three levels. Keep in mind also that in the earlier paragraph, Sri Aurobindo spoke of how the substance from each is as if um, growing into the next. If you recall the phrasing he uses, there are no abrupt chasms in nature. So he says, the melting of one thing into another, the mental body melts into the vital and to the physical, the vital body melts into the physical and the mental, and something of the physical body melts into the vital and the mental also. This, in the Ayurveda tradition, is described as the physical body having seven gradations of tissue or substance, which correspond effectively to the seven planes of existence, but it's as if they are replicated in the physical world. Something similar exists in the vital and in the mental bodies also, but much more fluid. And all these are impacting each other, each in its own distinctive way, making for a very complex mix of influences. So this is the big picture that we have to retain. You can see obviously from this perspective, there are many approaches implied to changing physical illness, curing illness or maintaining good health. One which is the most obvious is what we have already been discussing, intervention at a physical level, but through life force or through mind intention. The marmas are the entry points. If you pick a marma, for example, which connects to the index finger and are able to tap into it, you can modify the working of life force in the index finger. The same you will see in the nervous system, if you tap the link point where the nervous system branches out to the sensations of the index finger, and there you inject a mild anesthetic, the finger becomes numb. So here you need a biological knowledge to be able to selectively pick a finger. Unfortunately, with the marmas, it is not so specific to form. The marmas operate on types of life force flowing, not so much a particular finger, but the operation itself of the prana or apana vayus 
or the samana or vyana. Vyana would correspond to the sensation spreading and that's what is blocked by the physical nervous system. But triggering the prana or apana would increase vitality or modify, let's say, the sensitivity of uh, the perception or sensations or if on some other part of the body would increase the tendency for that part to accumulate substance or to throw out waste substance. All of these are modified through the marma operations. There are major marma centers. Two of them are on the shoulders, particularly here. The right side is connected, for example, to the liver and the left side to the spleen and pressing on those marmas or injecting energy or intention there can immediately activate or modify those functions depending on the kind of energy or intention you inject those functions can be slanted one way or other and you can see the power of such interventions or the knowledge how effectively it can be used or misused you could equally act on a marma to make a part of the body numb or an energy function to suddenly drastically cut back which would result in a whole chain reaction and even remember the marmas are link points plexuses are link points to the mental body equally change mental states so through the marma intervention you can change mind states life energy states biology changes and it's very powerful knowledge in one of the schools where marma vidya the knowledge of marmas is still taught the teachers well in some of these schools where it is still taught and there are very few left the teachers are very careful of selecting who they accept as students and i recall now it is about 30 years ago reading in a popular journal then we didn't have the internet there was a photograph series of photos shown of one of the students who the teacher had chosen to reject now this occasionally happens especially when a teacher teaches knowledge like this which can have great positive ben benefit or also potential for misuse they have to be very careful of the moral and ethical standards of their students and this particular student the teacher found a bit on the borderline and chose not to teach him further and rejected him from his school and as would be expected he comes out into the public to speak of the knowledge he has got you see that's where that was the flaw he had in his character and he demonstrated publicly the power of his knowledge he challenged somebody to come and attack him physically and the person was to rush towards him holding a knife and physically attack assault and, and the photo of the series of photos showed how as the person was approaching this man practitioner points to him with his index concentrates and within seconds the attacker loses consciousness and collapses on the spot and this practitioner explains how there are certain marma centers and remember marma center is for energy and awareness so you don't have to be physically touching at a distance you can direct energy and awareness on one of these major centers enough to shut down the link between the mental body and the physical and render the person unconscious if this can be done at a distance you can imagine what a skilled practitioner should be able to do uh, when facing a whole army or equally the same power used to heal people in Chinese medicine, because the connection is much more through the physical link of the needles, you find a similar power, highly skilled in its training, in which there was a demonstration which was shown on video. I believe it is still available on um, YouTube or these platforms, where a group of uh, skilled acupuncturists prepared a patient for open heart surgery and it was done by inserting these needles at specific points and then they would twirl the needle a certain number of times and they would keep going back and forth across the needles not everybody can do it especially because that kind of intervention requires a certain state of mind and energy flow injected through the needle 
The result was at the end of about 20 minutes, if I remember right, the entire region of the chest became numb, not only on the surface of the skin, but deep inside. Enough that the person was now ready for open heart surgery. And then the doctor began to cut. To ensure that the patient does not have a shock, a piece of cardboard was placed under his neck so that he cannot see what's being done to him. And in the video you see the doctor is cutting his chest open and going on with open heart surgery with no other anesthetic at all, except this intervention through the needles. Again, it shows you the power of such an intervention, that it can withdraw conscious awareness from a part of the body for something so major as an intervention. Imagine what it could do in the biological functioning through such interventions also. And so we have stories in the martial arts where a person is uh, killed by an intervention like this. And it was popularized in one major movie where you had Uma Thurman as uh, actress. She comes with this sword, in with a sword, Kill Bill, Kill Bill part one and part two. In this, she meets the person who has been harassing her. She is out for vengeance with this knowledge. And uh, towards the end of the movie, she gives him a punch and does some lock with the punch and the man realizes what she has done. She explains that from this point you will take six steps and you will die. That's it. So as long as he's, he's sitting idle, he lives, but the moment he starts walking he will die. We have similar stories in the life of Bruce Lee where when he died, which was at a very young age, it was very unusual because his body was healthy, there were rumors that he was killed by some such intervention where something was done to him by which, uh, I don't remember the term which was used, but uh, there was a name given that he was given an intervention by which after 24 hours the person dies of a ma massive cardiac arrest. The person who has done the intervention is far away by that time. You have no physical link, nothing measurable in the biology to demonstrate the nature of the intervention. But a punch given of energy with a certain twist of intention leads to a ripple effect that 24 hours down the entire heart just shuts down. Yes, there are things possible like this. That kind of knowledge does exist and thankfully it is kept held secret. But I want to highlight the positive side of it that with the same kind of intervention, you can act to enormously improve the health. And the key here is life force in its link to biology and to mind. And that is why you will find in the Upanishads, the life energy is described as the center of the wheel around which all the functions of life work, not only the biology, but also mind. It is also, Sri Aurobindo points out, the focal point of our ego instinct, the separative ego instinct. But the knowledge of the bodies and the way the life energy body is connected to the physical body and the mind body, and especially this knowledge of nadis and plexuses is the key by which so much can be done positively. So this is what Sri Aurobindo is referring to in passing. Now I read the full sentence and you see what it contains based on last time's discussion and this time. These, meaning these other bodies, vital and mental, possess powers, senses, capacities, which are always secretly acting in us, are connected with and impinge upon our physical organs and the plexuses of our physical life and mentality. You will see how in certain practices of acupressure they teach you, you press on these points and your power of mind or clarity of mind will tremendously boost. I believe pressing on the nails for example has that effect of suddenly making you much more alert or aware 
and certain centers for particular mental functions also. Although the influence on the mental body is relatively weaker than on the physical body, but through the biology to amplify the mental functions is also possible. We have today a whole class of drugs called nootropics. Nuo meaning the mental, they have an effect on the mind, they amplify clarity of thought or ability to focus attention and things like that. But if biological drugs can act through the energy body on the mind, an action on the energy body can have even more lasting uh, permanent effects on the mental body. And that means you can intervene on yourself through such an internal process instead of depending on physical or biological processes. Now this point is what Sri Aurobindo comes to in the next sentence. By self-development, one can become aware of them. Them meaning these subtle bodies and their powers and their senses and their capacities. So by self-development, we can become aware of them first. Second, possess our life in them. Meaning, right now you're living in your physical body only. You're not living in your vital body or mental body, though you have those bodies. What a pity. If you lived in your vital body, all the powers, senses and capacities native to the body, the vital body, would be available to you as spontaneously as your physical, biological senses and capacities are available to you simply by the fact that you're aware of your physical body. Equally, if you lived in the mental body, freely, all its powers would be available to you, including the power of remote perception or in the vital body, the power of sensing or acting upon universal energies and their um, actions in the environment or in the world. So, first, by self-development, we can become aware of them. Second, possess our life in them and then get through them into conscious relation with the life world and other worlds. That would be the third power. Remember the whole point of this discussion was it is through those bodies that the life world, mind world or higher angels act upon us. If you can begin to live in them, you can become conscious of the life world and act on the life world the way you act today in the physical world. What do you do in the physical world? You see a flower. You can see the flower is faded. You can water it physically. You can pick the flower, arrange it. If you were conscious in the life world, you would be aware of the life energy body of the plant or the flower. Water it in life world terms, whatever that would mean. Or draw from it nourishment as you would physically eat the leaves for healing yourself. In the life world, you could draw energetically from it for healing. Or remember, the natural powers of the vital are not bound to physical distance. So to you, the trees which are all over the earth would be felt in a continuum of life energy flow. You could feel the Amazon forest and the struggle of the trees today as there is a massive fire, unprecedented, burning the Amazon forest. And the nature of the fire is that in daytime it is all smoky, you have night, and in night time you see the flames, it is day. That kind of dramatic reversal on a physical level you would sense in the vital body, in the vital world. You would sense and see the beings that are involved in those fires, the fire beings, the tree beings, the human beings, and other beings of the vital world who are part of the complex mix of the problem there and perhaps you would be able to intervene upon them directly. The mother describes how once when she was traveling by ship through the Mediterranean, uh, crossing, uh, I think it was towards England, and in the ship, the ship was facing a huge storm, and there was even danger to the ship. And the captain was in a panic, and at that time she was with Theon, who was her teacher of occultism, he said to her, go and stop the storm. 
So mother describes how she went to her room, lay down on her bed. Now you see, what you would think normally would be she had to get onto the deck of the ship and do some incantation to act on the storm. No, that's not how it works. The vital consciousness does not need physical presence. So she goes into her cabin room to lie down, goes into a trance, comes out of her body, and as she rises out in a vital mental body, which is much larger, more embracing, she sees the whole space around her filled with these tiny beings who are dancing in a frenzy. That play in the vital world is what is creating in the physical world the condition of the storm. Now, If you tell this to a physical scientist, he will say you are crazy. The storm is the product of winds combining and pressure changes which create for this. Yes, it is okay as a superficial observation, but it does not explain the nuances of the observation. I don't know if you have uh, uh, seen this. When an actual storm takes place, you will have violent fluctuations in tiny parts. So if you open the window, the window is being sucked back and forth. The flag is violently fluttering. Little things, uh, little boards of the wood are violently shaking. If you think about it carefully, it means in a small space there is a pressure variation which is massive. Massive enough to suck an entire board out or push it back or a window violently slamming and opening repeatedly. It means in a cubic foot of space there is a fluctuation of pressure. Consider every cubic foot of space having a fluctuation of pressure. From your pure physics, it would mean the pressure of this variation and the pressure of that variation should even out rapidly to make for a large movement of pressure. A pressure variation across, let's say, 10 meters or 20 meters when a wind of, gust of wind blows is understandable from your physics. A rapid variation in a narrow part is not explainable by the physics. In fact, it should be evening out. Why isn't it evening out? we cannot explain, except by the fact that there is a local phenomenon taking place in your local one foot cubic space, which is equivalent to the larger phenomenon taking place in the whole area, which is your storm. And this is the energy variation caused in the vital world, in the part of it that leans into the physical world. When the energy there moves back and forth rapidly, it creates variations in the physical molecular movement, which leads to the pressure variation of the air. But the thing which is causing that agitation in the vital world, being life energy, is energetic being and even conscious being or semi-conscious generally. The little ones are semi-conscious. They may be presided over by a larger consciousness of the storm being itself. Now all this is mumbo jumbo to the physicist, but to the occultist is a living experience. There is an incident which took place in the ashram where there was a huge storm that had appeared, that had come on Pondicherry and it was one of the biggest. And someone in Golkund saw the being of the storm before him and painted it and mother confirmed that this was the being, which was the storm being. But in this case, there is the large being, which is the body of the overall storm. And then there are these smaller beings who are agitated. And then mother describes how she saw this, these beings dancing in a frenzy. And remember, they are not beings in the sense mentally conscious. They are more life energy, instinctive playing impulses. And so she, as if, leans upon them, connects to them and gently begins to calm them. And she says, calm, peace, peace. She describes this in the, in this whole, in the whole passage. But to do that, you cannot be talking to them as a separate one. You can't say, hey, please cool down. It doesn't work. They're just doing their thing. You have to literally connect with them in your energy, embrace them with your energy, and infuse into them the calm of your energy. There's a tricky point though. The moment you connect to them, their energy pushes back at you. 
their agitation could fill you instead of your calm filling them and that's why the very first foundation of any such training whether a cult or spiritual is to establish your base in a deep vast calm or peace having that you can bring that influence into an environment or on a concert a situation so a mere occultist would be dependent on the vitality and the strength of his vitality to influence but somebody who has a deep spiritual foundation would bring the influence of the spirit or we may even say the peace or calm of the self into that and immediately all those beings would become quiet and still so the mother describes how she did that it's a very simple brief description she says she brings calm into them they become quiet she comes back to her body she comes up to the deck and the whole sky is clear the storm is gone the waters are completely steady now to somebody if you narrate this they will say ah yes you know after a while the wind stopped and then the sun came through and the storm was gone it was a natural phenomenon no you're just seeing the surface workings you're not seeing what's behind but the moment you come out in your vital body you see what's actually happening and then you can intervene on that level and change or reverse you could actually trigger a storm trigger a violent wind or tornado or cyclone and there are examples of such things also by these people who have that ability i recall reading in a book uh, which was called rolling thunder it was a native american uh, medicine man who narrates i believe he narrated someone else doing it or someone narrated that he did it for some reason some of their people had been falsely jailed so he goes up to the prison and does an invocation and a tornado forms and he orders the tornado to rip out the gates of the jail to free up the people who are trapped inside and the explanation given is normally they don't do such things but you are allowed to do it only when the great harm or a great uh, injustice has been caused on the other side the idea though is there is a whole morality associated there is a power which can be wielded negatively or positively and you must have a moral base all of this is possible as long as the development is primarily on an occult level because who seizes the knowledge i the ego but when the same person is spiritually founded and it is no more the ego that lives but the true soul in its relation with the self and the divine then these dangers are not there of misuse it is also from that poise that one can become conscious of these bodies and live in them or act from them without any danger of this push back otherwise very quickly the very fact that you are able to engage with these energies makes for it that their influence on you is also that much more vivid and their influence can begin to creep in you the power kind of seizes you the high of the energy or the power begins to get to your head and before you realize it and it can happen quite quickly you are more a tool of their impulse than you being able to master them and this is inevitably what happens to those who enter the occult domain of practices or skill the inevitable uh, the requirement for occult practice is mastery of the vital plane that's where you are going to hit the physical most easily most directly and the moment you open to the vital plane the nature of the vital plane being desire it tends to fill you and seize you rather than you being able to master it therefore in the spiritual traditions they say avoid this it's a detour build your spiritual foundation and from that foundation of course all these will be available this is the approach in the integral yoga of course depending on temperament in some people these things may tend to evoke but if they avoid the temptation of engaging prematurely with the ability then they can go more safely on their on their way but once we are established in the psychic being and the self one can engage and it is even necessary to engage with all the levels of consciousness all the planes of our being in order to have a complete 
world experience and not this narrow band which is all that we experience from our gross physical body and its senses. So Sri Aurobindo describes how it is therefore possible to possess our life in them and get through them into conscious relation with the life world and other worlds. And now fourth aspect to this awakening and use them also for a more subtle experience and more intimate knowledge of the truths, facts and happenings of even the material world itself. By saying of even the material world itself, he is giving equal prominence to those worlds. As a result of that, you enter in relation with and even engage with or have intimate experience and knowledge of the truths, facts and happenings of all these worlds and even the material world itself. You see the formulation of even the is a very compact way of saying all of them and even this. Even this because it may not be obvious. We may think that having awareness of the vital and mental bodies would only give us access to mental and vital worlds but it even includes the physical world. So now let's understand all three and then especially the physical and in the phrasing he uses a more subtle experience and more intimate knowledge of the truths, facts and happenings of all these worlds. So first of all, the more subtle experience. The more subtle experience obviously in this example that we saw, the storm is much more a play of beings on the vital plane. That's the subtle experience of the storm. I remember in Pondicherry, we had a dramatic cyclone. This was about four or five years ago. It was just before New Year. And that's when a large number of trees were uh, broken, both in Oroville and in Pondicherry around the ashram. And even the service tree in the ashram main building broke one of its main branches. And it's a very serious occurrence. Mother saw in that when it happened in 1971, the representation in physical terms of the fall in consciousness of the people in the ashram. And so this storm had a similar meaning for us, including in Oroville. And it was a very uh, significant one, very symbolic, because these were the two areas where the maximum number of trees were destroyed. Up to 80%, I recall being told. But what was interesting in that storm was you had that particular pattern. And I recall seeing this, in a tiny patch of air, you had this violent fluctuation of air. And people who had little windows, I recall one of them saying, I just tried to open and the window slammed in my face and slammed back. That kind of violent shift is unexplainable. And it was there everywhere. And there were many people, and I heard this from many people who said, as we were trying to sleep, we couldn't, but they saw images of forms playing. And that perception was there in so many people. It was an example of this. If we were more conscious of the subtle worlds, we would have actually seen what was happening there. Mother describes a similar event that took place in Pondicherry when the ashram was physically attacked by some political groups. And at some point she was in her room and a stone was thrown and it hit the glass and broke the glass in her room. She immediately stopped what she was doing and went into deep trance. When she came out, she explained that the whole physical form of the attack was a representation on a physical level of Kali, who was dissatisfied with the progress, the pace of progress in the ashram community. I believe this was before Oroville was established, 65 or so. But this reality of what's happening on other planes, of which you see a physical manifestation, is the greater truth. And this is completely lost to us. So a more subtle experience includes realms of these domains, which is more, and so he says, of truths, facts and happenings. The truth of that plane is what's really 
what you see. Facts, yes, as a result of that agitation or that action on those planes, these things have happened. Again, on those planes or on the physical plane. And in the happenings, which are the final consequence of it, there is a storm, a tree branch broke, somebody was injured. That's the most material level or even on a vital level, a happening. Happenings are the most specific and narrow in outcome. Facts are more general, truths are more permanent. So I was trying to see how to articulate the relationship between these three terms. And we could put it this way. Truths are things which are always true across time, across space. So we can say a truth is, a truth would be, a storm is the physical representation of a vital being expressing a certain pattern of energy. That would be a truth. Anywhere, on any planet, in any fluid, whether in air or in the ocean, or even in the in space where you have storms also by the way uh, storms of plasma and the sun storm solar wind have their own storms their own turbulences and some of these can be quite violent and they affect the physical earth dramatically including earth biological processes all measurably and so all of these would have beings of life energy presiding over our expressions or centers of the storm. So this would be a truth. A fact would be that a more specific thing which is to a particular location or at a particular time. It is a fact that storms happen during these seasons. So whenever we have the winter season, it is a fact that storms are more frequent. A happening is even more specific. Right now the storm is happening. So truths, facts and happenings of subtle worlds and even of the material world are visible or experienceable to us in a more subtle and a more direct way when we begin to live in these bodies. By self-development we can become aware of them. First step. If you're not aware of the bodies themselves, you cannot possess your life in them. So you start with awareness that you have actually a vital body or a mental body. As a result of that awareness, you develop the second, possess our life in them. Bit by bit, you begin to sense what happens in them and begin to become conscious in them more and more. In the same way as we grow in our physical body and possess our life in the physical body more and more, by self, by self development, by training. If as a child, you have never done basic gymnastics, your possession of your physical body is not complete. You are almost handicapped in your coordination, in your skill of expression. But when you learn those skills, you do a cartwheel, you do a somersault, you learn to play an instrument, a musical instrument with your fingers, your consciousness is actually entering and infusing and seizing upon the nervous system and the material of your physical body and that's how you possess your physical body. A similar thing happens in the vital body and the mental body. You become aware of them and then as if a part of your consciousness begins to extend in them and grip the functions and powers and enter into them more and more until you're fully aware with the skill, the fine skill of a gymnast in the physical body that you have now in the vital body or in the mental body. Many who develop the mind's powers especially tend to have much more of the mental body training than the vital body because it's more easy, more conscious, more plastic, more aware. So the second level, after becoming conscious, you possess our life in them which we have not yet got. But a similar thing we have to eventually get, and that's the bigger part of the discussion, become aware of our life, but of our spiritual body, and enter into and possess our spiritual life. That is to be done still after. So what you're seeing here as a description actually is the first few steps 
of the real thing which has to be in the spiritual body eventually. So by self-development we can become aware of them, possess our life in them and then get through them into conscious relation with the life world and other worlds. Now we have access to those worlds and those happenings, you can act on them. So mother for example could be told that this is an actual case, Karnataka, there are not enough rains. So they sent a prayer, mother please we need rains and within a week strong rains begin and the rains continue and the same disciples now send a telegram to the mother, mother please stop the rains, we are having floods. And mother says, ungrateful humanity. There was not a word of thanks. You've asked for help, you've got it. Instead of saying, thank you, this is an expressing gratitude, you say, okay, that's too much, now stop. On demand, switch on, switch off. Sri makes this observation. A prayer is not like a machine where you put a coin in the slot and you get your doing. And there's a whole consciousness involved and a relationship involved. But well, disciples tend to be demanding of when they have easy access. So, so you have conscious relation to other worlds and you can know things happening there. Mother speaks for example of how at a particular time there was a comet that came. And she said she entered in contact with the being of the comet and she said it was a spiritual being and it was spreading a very fine substance into the earth's atmosphere to help in earth's evolution. Now the comet did not in any way physically come close to the earth. It was far enough that uh, astronomers would say nothing of it comes to the earth. But in fact there is an influence of the being which is reaching out beyond its physical body. Just as our influence and action in the physical world does not stop with the boundary of our physical body, we speak, we reach out, we send influences or thoughts at least and communicate with others in a wide range. So these beings and especially spiritual beings can spread well beyond the physical body of their inhabitation. In fact, one would put it the other way from the higher perspective. The physical body of the comet is the result of the fact that there was a spiritual being first around whom this substance materialized or the substance of the comet is the materialization in the physical domain of the consciousness of the spiritual being. Yes. And interestingly she uses this very suggestive phrase, she says the substance that the being spread was more dense than physical matter. What does that mean? You see today they speak of dark matter and dark energy uh, which is supposed to be somehow dense matter. But there are gradations of substance which we may not be able to tangibly access with our narrow physical senses but which nevertheless are part of the physical world. And so someone who lives on those levels can easily experience the world in this way and how much more interesting the world becomes, isn't it? She describes how this was somebody in the ashram who was a Jain in his traditions before he came to the ashram and in the Jain tradition the soul and the lines of the soul are associated with certain um, let's say preceptors, tirthankaras as they are called and this person for some reason drowned in the sea and mother says she saw the tirthankara associated with his family lineage come to assist his soul in the transition. Fascinating. And we have no idea of all these complex interactions taking place. She recalls how or disciples recall how she would be walking in the playground from east to west from one wall to the other in a state of deep concentration and meditation and on the east wall she would occasionally pause and as if look far away and then again turn and walk back and forth. And so one of her attendants asked her, Mother, what, why is it you're pausing only east wall and looking out there? And she said, each time I look in that direction, 
I see a great treasure which is hidden in the sea and I am trying to release it so that it can be used for humanity. Now you are walking in the playground, physical sight stops with the wall, inner sight sees beyond the wall and the vital or mental body when you live there, you see well beyond into the ocean and the beings of the ocean and the powers which are hidden there and she sees that and she acts upon it the way you would say, oh I saw in the flowing stream a golden nugget and I reached out and it was stuck in the rock and I pulled and released it with my physical hands. Well, a similar thing, an operation takes place in the vital mental body or in the spiritual body for a spiritual intervention. How much more rich the whole world and the experience of the world can become and is intended to become in our further evolution of which we have only so far developed awareness in the gross physical body and the physical vitality and the physical mind. All the rest is still waiting as our intended evolution and we come to the last point of course, a more subtle experience and intimate knowledge of the truths, facts and happenings of even the material world itself. So not only things of that domain but because the physical world is a densification of the vital world which is itself an expression of the mental world everything in the physical, recall the earlier paragraph has its corresponding power in the vital and by extension its corresponding idea force in the mental and not only you can become aware of those things but their resulting form and process in the physical world as in this case where she saw the treasure but the treasure needed to be released and the action was to be done on the higher levels. You will remember also how mother entered was trying to enter into to the domain in the vital world where large treasures were present and there was a huge serpent which was guarding it and the serpent had conditions which alone would permit her to access that treasure. Had she been able to fulfill those conditions and release that treasure, it would have had enormous consequences on the physical level. But the fact that there is such a correspondence in the vital world makes for it often in the physical world that the symbolism is represented. So we know of stories, a treasure is guarded by a serpent in the physical world. Well actually it's a truth of the vital world which has now represented itself in the physical world. So if you perceive things in the vital, you can sense their corresponding truth in the physical but even directly see what is happening in the physical plane. And this is what happens when people have this remote perception of the inner senses. You can see what happens and because your seeing is more fluid, you not only see what is physically happening but what is being attempted and also what will happen. So we come back to our classic example which I have drawn upon many times when the US government developed this remote viewing program for the military that 10,000 declassified documents, many more which are classified in which you can see how a remote viewer sitting in the United States was tasked with observing a particular facility in Russia which was closed off in a building he describes and accurately draws certain structures there which were later validated. In proportion to the human size they had giant wheels and huge crane lifting large objects to build what was to be the world's biggest submarine at that time. And the remote viewer is asked now project yourself one week into the future, one month into the future, two months into the future until at some point they see the object being released into the water and they have a date when the submarine will be launched. Now the remote viewer is somebody living primarily in the physical body with a partial awakening of his mental or vital perceptions. When you fully live in the vital and mental body, you could turn your attention to that facility, not only see what is happening there, but the sight itself sees the future development. The sense of perception is not like the physical sight, oh I see the flower. No, I see the physical bud of the flower and I see the potentiality of the flower blooming 
and it will be about two and a half weeks when it will bloom fully. You see that in the same glimpse in which you see the bud. Now imagine seeing every situation not only as it is physically but as it is intended to develop and the energy in it is pushing to develop and you see it all in a single glimpse. What a rich experience of the world. You walk into the forest, you see the way it will develop and bloom a few dozen years from now or a few hundred years from now. And so I complete with one last example. The mother used to drive along the, what is now the East Coast Road and uh, one of her attendants records and we have him on tape. He said, in the early 60s, mother would drive this way and often she would ask to stop the car, step out of the car and look from that road towards the west, that is the area of Oroville. And she would keep staring and it was barren desert at the time. So after having this many times, the attendant asks the mother, mother, what is it that you're doing? You're staring there for a long time. And mother simply says, one day there'll be a huge city which will develop here. And of course, Oroville started a few years later. When it started, all you had were a few huts, kith roofs. Nobody could imagine what is happening today and how much development has taken place. But we cannot imagine what will happen 50 years hence. But in that one glimpse of the desert, she saw the full development potential. And it doesn't mean it is bound to time in precisely the way it is seen. There is a push of the vital mental form unfolding in a certain way, variations of physical form certainly will take place. The pacing of those forms also can get stretched or compressed. That's part of the nature of the vital and mental worlds. So what you see is the broad development of line and maybe certain special elements of it. And you can say, ah, it will happen. Likely in 50 years it will be like that, but if it doesn't happen in 50 years, definitely in 70 years that will happen. That's the kind of perception one has, but you see where it will go. And this kind of experience of the world is so mo much more complete. Still, all that he's talking about is the physical, vital and mental. Introduce into this a spiritual perception. And then that would make it complete. But he is not talking of the spiritual yet. And for that, the phrase he has used by self-development, we can become aware of them and so on. By self-development. Mm -hmm. Self-development is a very carefully chosen phrase. It is not spiritual development or evolution. Self-development is taking what you are and developing your existing capacities of consciousness and skills. Self-development is what you do when you try to become a better boss, a more skilled worker or a more talented actor or a better mathematician or physicist or any of the current range of human development, these three bodies basically. None of this in itself involves spiritual development. Spiritual development is a fundamentally higher grade of consciousness or a deeper region of the psychic presence which are not included in this development. So imagine how much more rich your experience of the world and your ability to engage with the universe will be with just the self-development of these three bodies. If you stop with that, it will be merely what today is called occult knowledge or occult development. But if you go beyond it or view this only as a starting point for opening to the inner psychic regions and the higher spiritual domains, that is our primary objective. But having acquired the deeper or higher spiritual consciousness, you can turn upon the mental, vital and even the physical and enormously accelerate this part of their self-development by the power of the spirit, which can achieve much more in a few hours than what the physical effort of your personality through self-development would achieve in years of effort. And this is not an exaggeration. In a few hours you can attain to certain experiences and certain states and open to certain capacities which the normal process would take years of effort and strenuous 
laborious effort. And that's why the overall approach of the integral yoga is use only as much as necessary of this awareness to deepen and open to the higher ranges, develop a deeper foundation of the psychic and the spiritual, and then that upon turning upon this triple instrumentation will do this much more rapidly. And within a few years, the evolution of many centuries can be realized. Sri Aurobindo himself, from the point he formally begins his yoga, let's say 1908-1909, to 1914, had already established his consciousness in what he later describes as the lower part of the supramental or the higher part of the overmental, established there and exploring the higher ranges of the supramental. And from there he begins to bring down the highest ranges of the supramental, transforming the mind and then the vital and then working upon the physical to an extraordinary extent from the basis of that power. Which work was done in his body in the span of a few years, but then was being imprinted upon those around him, which of course was a longer and slower process. And so this is the overall strategy and we put this description in context of this bigger picture. So by self-development, we can become aware of them, possess our life in them, get through them into conscious relation with the life world and other worlds. He doesn't stop with the mental, one can go beyond. And use them also for a more subtle experience and more intimate knowledge of the truths facts and happenings of even the material world itself. And the most classic example of this most material exploration is of the theosophists in their work, particularly it was, uh, if I recall right, Annie Besant and uh, Ledbetter, who took different physical materials and by using the power of the inner sight, the power which is called the anima and laghima, the consciousness can as if penetrate inside the molecular structure, perceiving the molecules, go deeper to see the atomic structures and enter the subatomic structures. All this work was done more than 100 years ago. I believe it was 1905 or 108 and they described in meticulous detail, drew pictures of all the different elements, the standard element table of elements, and then they found variations on the elements, which at that time was unknown to physics, describing those variations, which later in physics were also discovered and they were called isotopes. But not stopping with elements, they went further into physical matter, going down to not only electron, proton and neutron, but going further into subatomic particles of the quarks themselves, which they have intimately described. Sri Aurobindo uses this phrase, uh, and we need to dwell upon it, a more subtle experience and more intimate knowledge. What is meant by intimate? When you know a person intimately, I know someone very well, but I know them intimately means I know them inside out. The intimate relates to the inner. And so to know intimately an atom is to see or experience it from inside out, unlike our current electron microscopes which see outside in. They may image an atom in a globular cluster or let's say of energy bundle, but they cannot see what is inside. Whereas this person who goes with a subtle sight sees the inside and from inside out describes it. That is intimate. None of our current approaches of physics or psychology are intimate perceptions. They are experiences but outside in. Exoteric from the surface, from outside. But the sight which is proper to the vital and mental experience is an inside out and therefore more intimate. I feel what the person feels from inside out. I experience their thoughts as they experience themselves from inside out. That's the intimate perception of thought 
or of emotion but now this intimate perception applied to the physical world get got them to describe even the quarks and the bundling of three quarks typically to make a particle and so on is all described there of course they had a different vocabulary and pictures all validated today by current physics many decades later sometimes and then they go still deeper and they come to what they call the anu you see this was the problem of correspondence of languages in the yoga tradition they speak of the anu as the smallest unit of matter the greeks took that same idea they called it atom atom and so when physics got to some element they said ah this is atom this is the smallest unit it was a wrong utilization of that word so the word anu today is also used for the atom which is not the smallest unit and as they went into subatomic particles they went to these smaller units but that's not the anu the true anu is that thing which is smaller than the quark which current physics has not yet discovered which they described and it's a fascinating description they describe it almost like a heart shaped whirling spiral of energy with seven bands with little dots of light on them and the whole thing is as if alive and pulsating and rotating at the same time with seven strands of which three are brightly lit and the other four are dimly seen now interestingly in the current physics there is a theory that describes the most essential particle as having seven dimensions and later 12 dimensions but of which only three are more overt the other are covert less developed but this is pulsating rotating and all elements which you will find associated all aspects you will find associated with subatomic particles of spin and charge and if it whirls clockwise it's one charge if it whirls anti clockwise it's the opposite particle of charge fascinating description and then they go still deeper and at that point you see when they are focusing upon some element they are also as if dismantling by the power of will perceiving and also working upon to change and they take this and try to go deeper into it and when they dismantle this and they come to the fibers or the dots of light on the fibers they say it ceases to be physical matter that is the true anu of the yoga tradition but and they name it correctly as the anu and so that when you dismantle it ceases to be physical matter and it becomes matter of the subtle worlds that's the extent to which their quest went now if they could do it in 1905 obviously yogis have done it in the past by the same power even more developed and that's how they had knowledge of things physical and having had the knowledge of things physical they went to not the happenings not the facts but the deepest truths and worked from there and so you have very unusual formulas in ayurveda where they'll take different materials process them in certain ways in certain combinations to give extraordinary properties which you cannot get if you don't follow the exact steps how did they get the formula they didn't try out millions of times with combinations they saw at the level of the truth brought in the materials and seeing at an energetic level found what physical processes could amplify or condense that energy pattern to a particular quality and that's how they developed these formulas and the whole science was built on this inside out intimate perception of the physical world matter and material processes today the physical science having lost that access is approaching outside in but much more rigorously and in much more detail bound to the limitation of the instruments though and with it all the complexities and confusions which come and so physics is as if at a at crossroads you cannot explain what you're observing you don't know how to describe certain phenomena you end up with contradictions in the quantum world etc and we are on the brink where you cannot go deeper unless you utilize such means of an inside out perception which also will happen and i suppose soon has to happen soon but the yogic approach to science and the physicalists approach to science join at some point in this exploration and confirm each other 
but this kind of physical exploration as it has been done in the last hundred years particularly has no precedent in the past and it was a necessary phase of human evolution to as if take an exaggerated materialistic viewpoint in order to be explore to be able to explore this because if you have the inner viewpoint too easily this becomes uninteresting why waste your time with a more superficial shallow perception when you can have a deeper intimate perception more easily and so that part was left as if unexplored in the past which now is being done and at some point the two will join so you see it's as if in evolution having touched a higher possibility you come down and take it all the way to the most material almost as if losing the access to the higher in order now to lift from the most material part and link it back to the higher this phase is happening in current science well so the description completes when the with the last sentence which sri aurobindo says we can by this self development live more or less fully on planes of our existence other than the material which is now all in all to us again self development not spiritual development by this self development we can live more or less fully more or less well the practical occultists less the more deep uh, seekers more but you begin to live more or less on planes of our existence other than the material there are those in whom spontaneously some of these inner perceptions have opened up well they live also a little bit on those planes less much less in the experience that ingo swan had the person i mentioned earlier the artist when his inner sight opened it was dramatic it was extraordinary in the kind of rich detail that he could perceive he could see these connections of energy between people and then concentrate to amplify and go into their fine substantial perception and describe them that kind of thing is rare so he had obviously a gift developed from other lives similarly uh, many of the remote viewers been stepping out of the body they went to see a particle accelerator and looking at it from the subtle body they were able to describe the stream of energy behind the particles of which the particles are made in ways that were quite amazing and some extraordinary things on this vital world or vital level of the physical particle flow and so on but his problem was he was almost as if going mad because he could no more distinguish between what was the physical world and what was the vital or mental domains or the mix between them he would see things which he thought were physical and he would begin to act upon it and discover other people were staring at him or when you have the inner sight your physical sight closed your inner sight doesn't close physical eyelids are covered by your eye physical eyes are covered by your eyelids but inner eyelids inner eyes are not so you try to sleep with your eyes closed but you're seeing everything happening in the room including the physical room and of course the vital and mental levels of the room and sometimes it's bright light in the vital world or the mental world i can't sleep because it's too bright in here with my physical eyes closed at night in a dark room isn't that a problem and then there are beings who come because he sees them they register that he is able to see them they want to interact with him and some of them may be not so nice and so his whole entire world was turned upside down he felt it was a curse rather than a blessing and at that point he reached out for help from others who had a clairvoyant sight but who guided him on how to close the sight and so just as physically you have eyelids to close in the vital world you don't have eyelids because it's all translucent material in the mental world there is nothing which can cover everything is open everything is transparent to perception so you cannot have your eyelids but you have an equivalent energetic function or an equivalent function of awareness which can choose to turn attention more into itself than out of itself 
similar to what you may do when you enter a kind of a daydream you're aware of your own thoughts but you're not registering what's happening around you even though your physical eyes are open sometimes it would happen i would be working in intense concentration with a some computer program and it involved sometimes holding eight or 10 threads of dependencies at a time with the mind so the mind would be fully engaged and then my mother would ask me a question if i disconnect i will lose a level of concentration which will take me 15 minutes to get back in to recover those threads so a part of the mind would disengage it would answer come back and this is untouched i'll finish my work go back and then my and say why are you doing this yeah, my mother will say oh you told me i can when did i say that because the mind was the part of mind engaged was so tiny and it was necessary to put an intention there to remember otherwise one would lose so that's because the concentration has the power to narrow to limit focus and it is this power which sri aurobindo refers to is the creative power by which the one who is infinite indivisible narrows consciousness to become finite and infinitesimal focal point it's a power of self limitation by dwelling on itself as if turning away from its wholeness on its wideness it becomes narrow and shut out to the rest so similar power exists in the mind mind turning into its own internal awareness is the equivalent of closing the eyelids in the mental body or in the vital body a similar movement of the energy choosing to withdraw into itself and shutting out engagement with outside effectively the person closes the gates of perception and one has to train this even as one has to for us to train to open and turn the gates of perception well in his case he had to train to close the gates of perception and find his normal see the power of perception was never lost he could consciously open and engage as much as he wanted later but it took him time to bring himself to this level of uh, uh, well control of the ability of course he doesn't describe it in these terms he just says he learnt it but this is how it's done and so when we are able to be conscious on these levels we can by this self development live more or less fully on planes of our existence other than the material which is now all in all to us now all this was to explain to us why we are not conscious of the vital and the mental worlds from where so much is pouring into us from the worlds through people and even from within our own inner subliminal realms <coughs> and so now shri aurobindo has completed what he had to describe of the physical world from the first principles of what makes for the physical world and experience the vital world the interconnection between these two and that was a whole paragraph a series of essential principles of their relationship and then why we are unable to experience and as a result what we need to do to become conscious of these domains you see this knowledge which he gives you here is not just why we are not conscious in the process he is telling you how you can become conscious that's how by becoming conscious of these domains you will become of these parts in you you will become conscious and the key points of link are the murmurs or the plexuses or even the organs functioning as they are linked to the life force so you can begin from where you are and as if open out become conscious of the vital and through it of the mental or become first aware of a mental and through it of the vital whatever it is this much is possible by self development and from this now he moves to the next plane in the sequence the mental world and thereafter the spiritual domains but what he will not do is to repeat what he has done before he will only tell you the essentiality of the mental world the essentiality of its relation to the vital and physical otherwise all the rest which we have already discussed applies now to the mental world and its relation to the vital and physical also but only what is different he will mention so remember when sri aurobindo writes it is uh, if you use a modern vocabulary 
which comes with software, it is highly compressed. You see, you can take a picture and compress it. How do you compress a complex detailed picture to make it a size which is one thousandth or a millionth of its original size? You take a photograph, it's made up of tiny dots. That's how you have an image or a video, a series of dots in layers of pictures changing every one twenty-fifth of a second. Then there is something which goes and says, well, this whole patch is repeated, so let's just describe it in one point and then say it is repeated here. So that whole description is compressed. This picture is repeated there, so let's just describe it once and say copy it there. And that much is compressed. In a video file, this image from the first picture to the next, you know, you have 25 pictures per second in a movie. But how much changes? First picture, I'm holding the glass of water. One twenty-fifth of a second, this has moved this much. Another twenty-fifth, it's moved this much. All the rest is the same. So why repeat the image? Just say, all the rest is same, only this much has changed. And what has changed? The shiny part of the glass is the same from here to there, except the top part and bottom part, which has changed only. Describe only the change. So what you do in a compressed video file, you have one detailed description of the image, and then one twenty-fifth of a second later, only the change. And then after that, only the change of the change, and so on. So you have changed, and then change of change alternating in a certain way, which makes for an enormous compression. I've gone into some detail here. That's what he's doing here. He described the physical world in great detail, the vital world in relatively less detail. What he has not described is repeated from the physical and the mental world is even less detail. What is not described is repeat from the physical, from the vital, and from the relation which also is repeated here. And so actually, if we really wanted to appreciate this paragraph which we will now read, we will not only study what it says, but we will look back at its correspondences of the relation of vital and physical and say now from the mental to physical, from mental to vital, how is it similar, how is it different? So in the very next sentence, the next paragraph, he says, What has been said of the life world applies with the necessary differences to still higher planes of the cosmic existence. You see, that's your compression language. What's the necessary differences? That's how he'll focus upon. So he's telling you, I'm not repeating the rest. For beyond that is a mental plane. He's going to give you a sweep of cosmic existence beyond just beyond? For beyond that is a mental plane, a world of mental existence in which neither life nor matter but mind is the first determinant. And now he will describe this and in the paragraph after he will describe how, in the same paragraph he will describe how the mental impacts on the lower, how it melts into the worlds below and the highest at the heights of mind power melt into the more spiritual existence. And that takes you to the next paragraph. These highest worlds are therefore supra-mental. And the whole spiritual domains he describes in one more paragraph, which are much shorter, both the mental and the spiritual, much shorter than the vital or the physical, both in paragraphs as well as the linkages and relationships. So this we will take up next time. Um, so we come back to the great importance that the vital world and the vital body has for our physical world and physical life and the mental body and the mental world and beyond that the spiritual. But going bottom up, we are starting with that which is the most tangible for us to that which from below seems more abstract, but from above is actually more powerful and more concrete, more real than even the physical. And so Sri Aurobindo will take us now into the mental world and its relationship with the vital and physical, which we will take up Friday after next, as next Friday I have to be out of station, unfortunately. And so we continue this on uh, Mm. September 6th. 
but it will be an equally fascinating passage from the perspective of the mind. Oh. Oh.